What is going on, friends? It's been quite some time, hasn't it? But we are back. We are back and on your computer or TV or phone screens. King of Chaos, Logan Black. And my buddies, we're here for Dude. Have you heard of this? It's the Music Roundtable Show where a bunch of friends sit around and chat up some of our favorite under the radar albums. With me, as always, John Torres and Scotty Cerriti. How are you doing, guys? Wonderful. Good to see y'all again. Very excited. And joining us as the guest this week, this is a dude who I've wanted on for quite some time. Finally was able to make this happen. Chris Horror Show, how you doing, dude? I'm doing great, man. I can't wait to uh, extremely disappoint everybody after you wanted me to have, want to be on the show uh, so hard. So appreciate, no, listen, appreciate it's, the it's, intro. It's going to be a huge letdown. <laughs> oh, stop that nonsense. <laughs> it's, it's weird because, like, legitimately... Anytime that I talk to, like, anyone who's a mutual contact of, of mine and Chris's, whether it be, like, a Jeremy Leary or whoever else, they're always, like, or, or Jeff Cannibal, too, is always, like, oh, like, how have you and Chris not, like, sat down and just bullshitted forever? And anytime <laughs> that we ever get to, like, hang out and chat, rarely does it get into, like, music. It's, it's, then, wild. it's wild. It's wild. It really is. Like, we touch on so much stuff. Right. Like, I mean, like, I think of past, like we've talked like comics and politics and like right. obviously, obviously like wrestling all over the place. Like, but so weird to like not discuss uh, so many similarities in music that we have. Right. And the fact that you absolutely just like crush and destroy the fucking T-shirt game. Oh, like, my <laughs> man, if you're following Chris on uh, Instagram, we'll plug that later. But if you're following on Instagram, ah, uh, his T-shirt game is on a fucking point. <laughs> But without further ado, we're talking about music, right? I'm not going to gush about uh, my man crush on Chris. No, we're going to hop right into talking about music. And we are going to start with Johnny Torres's pick. Johnny, what did you pick this week and why? This week's pick was The Greatest Generation by The Wonder Years. Uh, 2013, you could call it the final of a trilogy. It was really the third of their first three records, which is... Really, their lead singer really taking a deep dive into picking apart the problems he has with anxiety and mental health, along with a lot of you know baggage that he's carried along with him throughout most of his life. A lot of this record is really like the final scream at the wall of getting all of that out there. Um, so this pick actually came off the hinges of a couple different routes of inspiration. Scotty's last pick actually was a Motion City soundtrack album, which I had seen tour with the Wonder Years, which I mentioned on that episode. And right after we wrapped that, I, I thought to myself, I have, it's been too long. I need to get a Wonder Years record on here. And um, on top of that, we had also just been talking about Youth Fountain, which was an album that was pretty heavily based in like similar subject matter, like raw feelings of, you know, loneliness for, and stuff like that, like really just struggling through long winters. But this feels like the right next step after digging into an album like that, because the way Soupy digs for his catharsis is a little more granular. I feel like there's a lot of real life examples that he ties in with emotions at the same time, talking about his heart on the clotheslines running through the tenement buildings and you know, I feel like there's some more granular layers of reflection here, but that's also because he's had a couple records to pick through it versus the Youth Fountain record. It was their first run and it was a raw run at catharsis in that regard. Um, this to me is the most multi-layered songwriting that the Wonder Years ever did. They're used to be, they're usually like a peppy first track for their first two records, you know, kind of off to the races with pop punk, but it's, you know, heavier elements. This was their first real foray into, into slower songwriting. And I feel like the dividends really pay off, especially on songs like Madeline, where it's really just stripped away acoustics, just bearing soul. And then you follow that up with something like cul-de-sac, which is an upbeat jam about just having to leave a friend behind that's gone down a dark path. And then you wrap it all up with I Just Want to Sell at My Funeral, which literally calls back pretty much every chorus on the whole record. Um, this album, to me, just gains importance in my own life with time and repeated listens, and I'm glad I was able to bring it to the show. Yeah, You mentioned choruses, Ben. Like, 
Ufa. Like, I feel like the Wonder Years, and I, I know I say this a lot with a lot of the bands that you, you pick, Johnny, but, like, this specifically, like, this record really jumped out to me where it's, like, they have mastered that sing-along big arena chorus where, like, they know how to get the hooks in, where everybody is singing along, everyone's jumping, and the tempo is just there to fit all of that in, like, perfectly. This is just, like, for me, I would say this stands out as a summertime band only because this is when you go to festivals, and these guys seem like a festival band to me because, shit, they're going to draw a huge crowd. Uh, yeah, the chorus is woof. Um, but I want to hear what you guys thought. Chris, give us your thoughts on uh, The Greatest Generation. Uh, this, like, this album really kind of, like, hit me, kind of, caught me kind of flat-footed. Like, I, you know, I'm familiar with the Wonder Years, right? Like, we, we've all kind of heard their stuff. They're, they're, for my part, have seemed fairly kind of, like, standard issue, like, pop-punk kind of, like, a solid sound, right? Um, and on my initial, like, my initial listen through, I was like, okay, yeah, like, this is, you know, it's, it's good. It's exactly what I expected, right? Like, it's the same kind of, like, the same kind of uh, sound. And then when I dug into it again and listened and started really kind of, like, paying attention to the lyrics and the subject matter of the songs, that's when I was just like, oh, oh, okay. This is, like, this is a whole new, this is a whole new thing because we're not singing about, like, pining for my ex-girlfriend or sad because somebody doesn't like me back, you know, like, when they got to that, uh, and man, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm terrible, terrible, terrible with song titles. Um, but like, it can't be they, any worse than me. Don't worry. Oh, oh please, I am. <laughs> I am. Uh, but when they got to that that one, uh, there's that one song where he, um, where he's like singing about how he knows that like these things are in his blood and these are demons that he's going to have to deal with. Like that really, like I mean, boom, like right, hit me right in the fucking soul. Uh, you know, I because I, I this is you know. Uh, without diving too deep into things like this is a big part of why i'm straight edge is because of like my you know my family history of like alcoholism and how i know that i'm like really kind of probably prone to that same you know that, that same kind of problem and so i you know have just stayed away the whole time so that like you know really really landed hard for me um and yeah i was really like you know i really was just blown away by like like exactly what you're saying, you know, it's like like a, a, a cathartic album that is way more like personal and introspective than I think you uh, really ever consider from the Wonder Years. You know, if you're just kind of like a casual fan. Um, yeah, no, I, I thought it was awesome. Uh, truthfully, like I, I, I thought it was great. Yeah. Um, so it's you you mentioned something for me where like I'm in the same boat as you were like they were just a band where like there was one or two songs that like wrestling people had recommended to me uh that that are on my 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 gym playlist because it's literally what's um i'm i I don't like the person who i was then or something like that where the 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 the, the, it's into the chorus it goes i'm working baby face like mid-south in the 80s i got a blade hidden in my wrist tape which i'll scream mid-workout because it's just a brilliant line because they're wrestling fans huge wrestling fans uh but i hadn't heard anything besides like those one or two other songs and then I get into this, and again, I think the song you were talking about, The Devil in My Bloodstream, yeah. which, like, again, same reasons. Boom, hit me. And then right after that, goes into Teenage Parents, and I'm not ashamed to admit, I fucking broke that broke me. Because fuck. I grew, that is as close to, a, like, me like as you can get with a song. We're just growing up broke and, like, you know, you know just trashiness and just, like, man... The dude was able to put that together in a song with a fucking catchy guitar line. Brilliant fucking stuff. Like, God damn. And it's rare that, like, stuff that is new that, I, that I'm hearing does that to me. So kudos to these guys. Yeah. Uh, before I bury this record with something else, Scotty, go ahead and keep putting it over. Uh, I really, really like this record. It's emotional, but it would be a perfect example of when people explain like there's a difference between emotional music and emo music because it's a type of relatable emotional that, as we've all said, it all hits us in in certain aspects. And when I was listening, because Logan, you had mentioned the hooks, and I kind of got feelings of uh, that Jeff Rosenstock record that I had picked Ah. early on where they were these super, like, 
choruses, but the, the, the hooks were just so relatable. But that was this entire album was just one after another of holy shit, like stop writing about me, please, without sending me checks. I know you have the money, you sons of bitches. Um, yeah, this is probably my favorite Wonder Years record. I really, really like this album. Yeah, so um, I, I, I may have uh, jumped, uh, jumped the gun a bit on that. I'm not burying the record at all, but there's one thing that, that I do need to criticize about it because it's something that I criticize about all pop punk um, where... Again, you drew me. They drew me in with all these, you know, songs that are just so emotional. But I feel like so much pop punk falls into like this thing that I can't relate to being a kid from Brooklyn and just like growing up in New York City, and then just like boom, all the talk about the suburbs and being, you know, hanging out, all, all of the suburb talk, which I feel like these guys had less in, but certainly. Um, we could die like this, where they, they really get into that kind of stuff. We're just like, all right, that took me out of it. But then right after that is Dismantling Summer and then a bunch of other stuff, which is great. But in general, like there's so much. And I think this is why I avoided bands like this is because all those bands, literally that era of music with the music videos was all like neon shirts, which I'm, I'm a bigger fella. I don't look good in that in those colors. Uh Hanging out by the pool. Well, we had an outdoor pool, and it was, you know, above ground, and it was maybe, you know, wide. You know what I mean? Like, I can't relate to that kind of stuff, and it took me out of it. But these guys, uh, I, I can't put over how surprised I was uh, with how much fun this record was and how, again, emotional and, and, and drew me in with that. If they just got rid of that one song, this would have been a perfect record for me. Um, it's, funny you, it's funny you mentioned that because that's probably my least favorite song on the record. That's fair, man. Like I, I just, it's just, like I said, it, it doesn't do it. I have this discussion with uh, with Benny all the time, where because you know he's this he's a suburban kid, grew up on pop punk and hardcore and all that stuff he plays. Like, oh, you're gonna play another band complaining about growing up in the suburbs? Like, Shut up. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, we have ratings for this uh, for this album, uh, as we always do. I'm going to start with you, Scotty. What did you rate The Wonder Years' Greatest Generation? I give this one uh, 9 out of 10 hours spent listening to Punkorama in my therapist's waiting room. <laughs> That's a good one. Chris, what did you rate this one? Um, you know, I'm, I'm probably going to go... Uh, uh, I saw... I saw uh, Man, you're gonna have to you're gonna you're gonna have to hit me with that rating. You have to get me with that rating again. I've already forgotten what it was. Was it the therapist listening to pop punk police in your therapist waiting room? Like it was listening, listening to Punkorama. Punkorama. There it is. All right. So I'm probably gonna go. Uh, I think I'm a. I think I'm a solid like seven on uh, seven out of ten uh, listening to Punkorama in my therapist waiting room uh, on this one. Just you know, like the 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 pop punk method of delivery, like kind of nudged it down a little bit for me. But, uh, yeah, overall, very solid. I gave this one 8 out of 10. All right, let's, this is a long-winded one. 8 out of 10, pop-punk bands falling into the stereotype of being named after TV-slash-movie references. Oh, wait, time out. Are we doing our, are we doing our own rating? We're not, we're not following uh, the guy no, who's out with If you've got your own, go right, up, right ahead all right, with Okay, you. okay, all right. Now, I, was, I, was confu I was confused on the rules, but I got it now. I'll get you on the next one. All good, dude. Johnny, what did you give this one? Uh, nine out of, nine out of ten. Uh, the Wonder Year parody of the NWO logo. Ooh, that that is a good shirt. I have that shirt. Doesn't uh, fit me anymore, but I have it. Ah, uh, brilliant stuff. All right, before we move on, any other questions, comments, concerns, or feelings on the Wonder Years? Cool. I just, Let's I do. Move want, on. I, I do want to note how thematically appropriate your Bayside hoodie is, though. Yes, huh. sir. We had we had them a number of weeks ago on the. Uh, <laughs> On the show, another Johnny pick. And another one where I was, again, Bayside was a band that I avoided because I was, I'm a shitty music hipster, uh, and I love the record. Uh, let's go with Scotty's pick for this week. Certainly threw me for a loop. Scotty, lay it on us, man. Nice segue from music hipster to my pick, by the way. That was, <laughs> that was, that was really good. Uh, I went with Tom York of Radiohead's first solo album, The Eraser. Um, came out in i believe it was 2005 right at the height of radiohead being on the climb to being one of the biggest bands in the world and i kind of wrote it off at first because i was just like i 
can probably figure out what he's going to do. It's either going to sound like the early stuff or it's going to be an album of stuff that he thought was too weird for Kid A. And I was completely blown away by it when I finally sat down and listened to it. Um, I think the first four songs is like one of the best groupings of four songs on an album I've heard in recent memory. Black Swan is still one of my favorite Tom York solo songs. And this record, for everything that it is, for it just being a dude who's done a lot in in music genre-wise or just writing-wise or even as a collaborator, just taking time for himself and, and letting himself pretty much loose in a room full of synthesizers and instruments and going apeshit with it, which is everything I want out of a Radiohead or a Tom York record. So this was, this is fucking spectacular to me yeah this is certainly uh something that you would hear at a bar in williamsburg or bushwick from Brooklyn. this is very bushwick. very much something that but it depends on the bar some bars you, you you'll hear like some heavier some bars are playing hip-hop but this is like that chill bar the bartender is definitely wearing skinny black jeans and in a size small black shirt because you could fit into it uh and we're chilling the lights are dim uh, this was, uh, I don't want to say that, I mean, this certainly threw me for a loop in terms of just like something that, that I, I never would have listened to, but also this was, I wrote that, this is definitely what I expected a Tom York record to sound like. Uh, it was interesting. It, it was, it was certainly an interesting, uh, listen for me. I, I'll get into details in a bit. Uh, Johnny, I'm going to go with you. What did you think on this Tom York record? So here's a fun fact. I know next to nothing of Radiohead's body of work. I know Creep, and that is it. And I'll tell you why. Fair. Because when Rock Band 1 came out for the Xbox 360, I had to play Creep 850 times in the first like three hours of playing the game, and I never wanted to hear Radiohead ever again. And then you know what my brother did? He bought me my Iron Lung for DLC for like Christmas or, or whatever the next occasion was. And I wasn't super huge on playing that either. So I just kind of like, well, we're <laughs> 0 for 2 on Radiohead and this exposure was not good. So I'm just going to not ever touch on it ever. So this was the first of any sort of Radiohead that's ever come across my radar. So I'm coming into this completely cold. So just bear that in mind. But um, really, really like interesting stuff here and the first thing that i could really liken it to because i have such little frame of reference in the radiohead universe was when deftones did that side project crosses and it sounded a little more electronic than and like deftones will still lean into the electronics every now and then but it seemed like they did it more on that side project so that's kind of what i likened this to only knowing creep in my iron lawn and hearing like real electronic influences here um the clock was a really friggin cool track that was like the black stallion off the cross is record to me like the the one big track that went into a couple different playlists um yeah for something that i largely didn't know what i was expecting i got you know a handful of like some deftones elements i got a little bit of red hot chili peppers here and there like if they were on like if red hot chili peppers was put in like like desaturated, like like played in black and white or something is the best way I can put it. Um, because yeah, in black, it. Wow. <laughs> black, I thought that on Black Swan and Symbol Rush both. I'm like, I feel like there's like a Chili Peppers element somewhere here. Like Chad Smith stopped into the studio for a second and said he had an idea. But um, really, really cool record. Um, this might be enough to for me to give Radiohead another try. We'll talk yeah. about that later, I promise. Yeah, you know, I'll be, I'll be real with you. Like, I'm in a similar boat where, like, Radiohead for me was literally, like, my father loves Radiohead. So, like, growing up, we would be, like, driving places and stuff. We'd always be playing stuff. Um, I am not at all a fan of, I'd say, like, half of Radiohead stuff where it gets more electronic. I like Karma Police and uh, No Surprises and, like, I think the, the chill, moody, but just, like, Oh, what a great fucking song. That's the stuff I like. Once we start getting to, like, Kid A, it's like, ugh, pick up a guitar, you fucking jerk off. But that's just my opinion. This one for me, uh, you mentioned, uh, you said Chili Peppers and Black Mouth, which I think is such a brilliant way of putting it. Goddamn, Johnny, like fucking Einstein over here with music. 
But, like, I, I wrote down it was a very good job of creating, like, atmospheres. Like, I feel like this was this was not so much a listen for me in terms of, like, this song or that song. This was more like, all right, what mood are we trying to create? Which I could respect from an artistic perspective, uh, most definitely. Chris, what did you think of this one? Um, my, in my initial, um, are, is there, is everybody here familiar with Adam and his package? Yes. Okay. All right. So my, my, my initial, you might, you might be the only one that gets this in Logan. My initial <laughs> playthrough, uh, when I, when I first heard it was my, my one note was, it sounds like this is what happens when Adam and his package gets depression. Um, like <laughs> the first, like the, like the first couple, the first couple songs, like, and I like, I, uh, I listened to it initially kind of piecemeal. Right. Like I caught a couple songs, had to stop and do some work and then like listen to some, like listen to some more my first playthrough. And, uh, I, you know, it, it sounded at the time uh, very similar to, um, you know, OK Computer. Uh, it had a, had, a, had a very similar kind of feel and vibe um, when I did that. But it was hard. I think, like you said, like I, I think this album needs to be taken in kind of like take it in as a whole, which I did, in, like I did in the second playthrough, I took it in like just in one sitting. Uh, and I think that is like the way that it kind of like resonated more with me than like individual songs, because like you said, it's just like the mood kind of keeps getting set and then fluctuating a little bit like throughout, you know, as, as the album goes. Um, but yeah, I mean like on, on the whole, like after, you know, after like kind of the last big Radiohead release that I, listen to several times being okay computer like this is pretty much exactly uh i think what i kind of expected uh from you know his, his kind of solo stuff um and i think when you i think when you said that you just kind of like put him in a room full of like synthesizers and let him go to town like that's yeah i think that's that's a pretty pretty accurate summary from from where i was uh from where i was sitting so one of the notes that i had put down was that um i felt like the album grew as it continued, like there were a lot of like layers to things, but I did also know that the first song literally just sound like uh, computers, like computer noises. Yeah, yeah. Um, but then yeah. I said it, it grows quite a bit from there, and like for me, like when you, you see guys like Tom York who have put, I mean, like what a ridiculous body of work. Like there's just so much out there, and it's interesting to to, to me for me to think that like. You've got guys like Trent Reznor or Marilyn Manson uh, or t tons of others who are making, like, movie soundtracks now. Like, with their ability down with, like, digital music and electronic music and create soundtrack. How has Tom York not done, like, a weird indie movie soundtrack? Right. He has. The oh, Suspiria has remake. That he did the Tom Suspiria York. remake. Oh, yep. okay. All right. Fucking bro. Okay. Right. Now, now I'm going to go back and check that out. Because uh, that's fucking awesome. Like the whole time listening to him, like, there's no way that this guy on a movie soundtrack. But nope, he did it. It wasn't even an indie movie. It was a big old movie. Look at that. Three and a half hours long of just Tom York. It's pretty great. I will uh, take note of that. That's that's pretty dope. Um, yeah. So we've uh, we've got some ratings for this, Johnny. I'm gonna start with you. What rating? Would you give uh, Tom York's album? Seven out of ten times you question why Tom York, despite having supposedly never done drugs in his life, has yet to make his own absinthe. <laughs> uh, nice. Uh, you know me. I love them long-winded ones. Uh, Chris, what did you rate this album? Mine is going to be far more brief. Uh, six out of ten Moog synthesizers Daisy Chain together. Oh, man. You're bringing me back to fucking high school right now. Sweet Christmas. Uh, mine's short as well. Six out of ten soundtracks to robot porn. Uh, <laughs> uh, Scotty, what did you rate this uh, one? Nine out of ten times I've had radio tickets in my cart at Madison Square Garden, only to be told that it was sold out by the time I got to the checkout process. Ooh, that, oh, yeah, that's when you that's gotta hard. fight people, man. Yeah, that's, that's when hard. you gotta fight motherfuckers. Uh, fuck and they're Radiohead fans. I, I could I could probably get an easy advantage on at least a couple of them. Yeah. Mm. Uh, yeah. Fuck fuck Ticketmaster. If there's one thing that I've enjoyed uh, from this uh, from this uh, quarantine, it has been not having to deal with Ticketmaster. Uh, before we move on, any other questions, comments, concerns, or feelings about Tom York's uh, The Eraser? 
Sweet. We're going to move on to the album pick from our guest this week. Chris, what did you pick and why? So uh, my pick was uh, the Soviets, uh, LP3. Um, now, uh, this honestly is, is not uh, the album that I probably would have like ideally picked uh, from the Soviets. Um, but uh, as we were constrained by what's on Spotify, and for some reason they only have their third LP and some B-sides, rarities on there, uh, this uh, this this kind of this kind of had to suffice. Um, uh, I think overall, like the Soviets are, are a band that uh, I found through like reading uh, a, a, a comic, like a, like an autobiographical comic, Snake Pit. If any of you are familiar, um, but uh, the guy who writes it, Ben Snake Pit, he like for every like autobiographical like day he does, he writes uh, he has like a little note for what like song is pertinent to like what he's either when he's drawing it or what was going on that day. Um, and so there's a lot of like, there's a lot of really, really cool bands that he lists in there. And the Soviets are one that I just kind of like found through that. And like, man, immediately I was just immediate hooked on, uh, their whole sound, um, their whole, like, like the whole presentation. They've got a band member who's nicknamed the, Stur the Sturgeon. And I love that. Uh, you know, I'm, I like, I just, I like, and I, and, and everybody that I talk to like all the time, like I, I constantly like bringing this band up to talk to people about it and nobody that I, I, I think very, very few people that I know, uh, have ever like even heard of them. Uh, so I'm always here to like, like preach about how awesome the Soviets are and how everybody should be listening to them, even though they're broken up now and they're not going to make any more music, but yeah, no, I love, I love, I love this band. Uh, and the, the album is like, it's, I mean, I was like, like they're all, their albums are all kind of like fairly uh, similar sounding. They weren't put out, they weren't put out like too terribly far apart from each other. And they didn't really like change a lot of the sound, you know, uh, but you know, all of their, like the way their, their vocals hit uh, and the way that they're like largely, um, you know, female fronted uh, punk rock, uh, in like present, presented in a way that's like not really like uh, what's the word I'm looking for like it, it's not like they don't they don't really try, try to draw attention to that fact you know what I mean like they just kind of like they just kind of like they are and you can see that and you can hear that influence but you know it's it's not really like a point of like they try to sell themselves on it because their music is just so fucking good that like they you know they carry on. Um, yeah, uh, so this is this is the Soviets, and it was awesome. Yeah, but, you know, you, you mentioned uh, how you tell, talk to people about this, and, and they don't uh, they don't know of the band. And this is one of those bands who I definitely heard ba heard of back in the day, because '05 was when I was going to like shows a lot, and I was going to Warp Tour and all that, and I definitely heard of this band, and I avoided them. I chose to avoid this band because I'm a fucking shithead music hipster, and just like. If it's not like directly in my wheelhouse, and now I'm more, much more open. But at that point, if it was not in my wheelhouse, fuck this band, they suck. I'm gonna avoid them and flip them off. Uh, and that's why I was stoked to have. All right, like with this show, it's forcing me to sit down and listen to a lot of bands that I avoided, and it always ends up working in a very positive way. Uh, Scotty, what did you think of LP3? I can see why your first time listening to them grabbed you within the first couple seconds, because that's exactly what this record did for me. It kind of gave me the same vibes that I was getting when I discovered, you know, bands like X and the Subhumans way back, because it just has that super raw, super angry punk rock sound to it when it comes to the music. Um, I was very surprised to find out that this band was from Minneapolis, because usually when you have certain areas, you kind of fall into getting lumped in with the other popular bands of that genre. There is like there is no connection to Husker Du or anything with these guys, and you would think that would be the biggest one considering. Um, this was awesome. I was just upset that it was as short as it was because I could have easily gone another 10, 15 minutes and, and been very, very happy with the rest of my day. This was a really good record. Yeah, dude, it, it's funny that you mentioned uh, the the you know where they were formed. I, I had put down in my notes. It's interesting to me that like Midwest punk bands, like I could listen to punk rock, and if a band is from L.A. or like the West Coast, I'm like, and West Coast, immediate, it immediately sets off New York because those areas have a sound. You could be from like 
you know, the Bronx, or you could be like from different areas in New York, but fuck, I will know that you're an East Coast band. Midwest stuff? Man, like Dillinger 4 is fucking Dillinger 4 and nobody else. Who's could do is who's could do and nobody else. This band, while they've got their influences, they're very much the Soviets, and that's it. Uh, yeah, fucking, I, I, well, speaking, speaking of influence, I wrote down, I get big, like, Ramones vibes yeah. from them. Obviously, you know, punk rock is always going to have that th- those three chords, but I was, you know, it's very chanty, it's very anthemic. Uh, and also, I'm getting shades of the hives. And I say that with, like, mm. all the thumbs up in the world because uh, uh, Veni Vidi Vicious uh, is a 10 out of 10 album for me, 1,000%. Uh, and it's literally when I knew that I was going to marry my wife was because we the, the album came on and we talked about how much we fucking loved it. So, they, yeah, those vibes are like two thumbs up vibes. Johnny, what do we think of the Soviets? So wildly enough, um, when this when, when this band first got dropped in the chat, it was one of those that like I couldn't place the sound or anything, but like I had heard that name before. And a friend of mine about nine or ten years ago at t- to this point had invited me to go to fest and i wasn't into most of those bands i didn't know anybody at the time so i like declined but i looked back at that lineup that he had invited me to after this was dropped in the chat and it's like all these bands that i listen to now are there and why didn't i know what i know now 10 years ago like the menzingers were there and the gaslight anthem were there and oh, it was man. It was it was a brutal fest to have missed, but I didn't know that then. But yeah, the Soviets were on that bill, so that's where I had, that's where that name rang a bell. But holy shit, what like just a perpetual jam the whole way through. Like it doesn't ever really dip much in tempo. Like it's catchy head bob city pretty much the whole way through. Um, and even then, like while everything to me is incredibly catchy and like just bolsters like a foundation in those in those like th- that sick crop of female fronted punk rock we see these days like the interrupters and bad cop bad cop yeah. it's just what a what a time for like that subgenre to just really be picking up steam i love it um middle of the night and thinking of you are both like two that like i had to run back multiple times and this record i probably listened to four or five times because as scotty said it was very short but it seems like every time middle of the night or thinking of you came on it was like 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 that's the one that like i'd shut off my spotify and then end up singing around my house for the rest of the day um yeah really really great record i was really sad when i didn't see more on spotify but i guess that just means i'm gonna have to go digging elsewhere right i i uh have it on my list of things to do to hop into YouTube and see like what a live yeah. show of theirs is like, um, which is what I did with with my pick this week. But we'll get into that in a bit. Uh, Roller Girls is what is the one that jumped out to me just because that's just such it's just a fucking fun song and I, and yeah. I think that's really what it comes down to. Where like for me, this was a fun album, and sometimes you just need a fun fast album. To fucking two-step wherever you're at. It's yeah. sometimes you just need that, and I think I think this was an excellent pick for this week. Uh, but we've got ratings for this one. <clears throat> Scotty, what rating did you give uh, LP3? I gave this one eight out of ten times. I've discovered one of my new favorite bands, Crate Digging. Crate Digging. Uh, mm, crate Digging. Remember going out and doing fun things. Sweet Christmas, <laughs> Johnny. <laughs> Uh, 8 out of 10 rad fest bands who in their own words couldn't tell you why they broke up but did I gave this one 8 out of 10 Doc Martin drop kicks to the side of the head Um, for my for my for my purposes this is 9 out of 10 uh, roller derby girls in the stomach while a band with a lot of woes in the chorus plays in the background that's about as perfect as life can get that's that's my my take on that. Uh, any other questions, comments, concerns, or feelings about the Soviets LP3? Alrighty then. So we are going to then move on to my choice. Uh, so uh, the way so I'll try and make this quick as possible. Uh, 
I was listening to, I heard about this band. The name of the band is the Kings of Nothing. N-U-T-H-I-N apostrophe. Uh, I was literally listening to, I think, Tiger Army Radio on uh, on Spotify. Uh, just trying to, you know, enjoy spooky season. Because, you know, it just passes by. And this band came on. And I'm like, it sounded to me like a live recording of... Just like a band from like the 60s, like doing that like Little Richard, Jerry Lee Lewis sound. Uh, but like, you know, they were just fucked up on drugs and playing really, really fast. And that's what it sounded like to me. I'm like, I love this. And I looked it up and it was a band from the 90s who just took this old rockabilly sound and was like, we are going to just go wild. Um, I listened to this album between hearing it that day and the day when we all chose this 10 times. I just, it's short, so it works, but I obsessed myself with the album uh, called Get Busy Living or Get Busy Dying. Uh, it is, I have to, like, just, for me, everything that I love about rock and roll music, literally everything, it's dirty, it's loud, it's aggressive, it's in your face, it does not stop attacking you, and there's fucking hooks in there. Like, there's, there's some melody. Uh, yeah, Sweet Sassy Molassi. I fell in love with this record immediately, and I have not stopped listening to it for, like, the last month. Uh, but I would like to hear what you guys think about this one. Johnny, what did you think about the Kings of Nothing? <sighs> if I had a bar, I would play... Like I would, I would play this record like front to back every Friday night at eight o'clock, and I would have specific specials when I would do so, because this record is like in the one percent of records that do this, in my opinion. Where like it conjures up to me this image, where like I'm walking down a cobblestone road in like I in the hills of Ireland, and there's a warm like lantern-esque glow coming out of this building and i hear this music and i walk inside and it's like like steamboat mickey mixed with an irish pub and everybody's just dancing and they're swinging the flagons and there's people dancing on the piano while the guy's standing up playing the piano and th this conjures up like a whole scene to me like front to back um you could this passes what I like to call the 1940s swing test, where if you put this record on and you pull up a YouTube video of 1940s swing dancing, the two mash up perfectly. Um, there's not a dropped track on this whole record. This to me, I wrote punk rock Brian Setzer like five or six times running through this record. And as as Logan said, this is a short run. So yeah, I probably ran through this like, 15 or 20 times and it was probably because once it started over i just didn't want to hit stop um really really special record i uh, i can't say enough like you can call it punk rock you can call it rockabilly but it's it's completely in a, in a league of its own uh, unbelievable yeah i i think that's what it what stood out for me where it's like you can call it either of those but like in reality it's a rock just a rock and roll record that just does its own thing. And, uh, I mean, the, the singer has, I, I, I'm gonna, I don't remember his name, but has such a, just like, that is a cigarette and whiskey stained voice if I've ever heard one. Like that is, it is like the pain of just being like a, a miserable dude playing bars your entire life. And this band didn't pull out, put out a whole lot of stuff. It was like two records and that was it. Uh, and then those records are like, you know, I think there's some, some time between them, at least on Spotify, uh, to my knowledge. Um, Chris, what did you think of The Kings of Nothing? Uh, so this is, kind of a, this is kind of a cheat for me because I was already familiar with The Kings of Nothing. Um, like I've known about them for, I mean, forever. And essentially like, uh, when you when you put it in there, I was I was immediately like, wait a minute, did you just did you choose that album for me? Like, is that? Is that? <laughs> um, but yeah, like I I like so this this album this album is interesting in um, how I think about the Kings of Nothing because like a lot of their early stuff that I was exposed to um, was this kind of like this this kind of like weird like 
rockabilly sexual double entendre kind of stuff right like it was a lot of that was a lot of their like uh a lot of their songs a lot of their sound like from from when i was first exposed to them and so for a long time like my i my idea that i've had in my head of them is just like oh they're this kind of like they're kind of a jokey rockabilly band whatever they like you know that they're singing rockabilly songs about like doing butt stuff eh? right like uh but so <clears throat> Recently, uh, I'm, I'm relatively recently, I want to say within the past, like, uh, probably a year and a half or so, um, there was a song that came up in suggested tracks on Spotify for me. It's that, that other, the other side of hope. Um, and when like that song came on, like, I forget the, I forget what I was in the middle of doing, but like, I stopped everything like to like, I stopped everything and like, was like, hold on. And like, had to play the song back a couple times to like really listen to it uh, before looking up, you know, who, the, who the hell is this? Like, and I was stunned that it was the Kings of nothing. And then that whole, uh, that whole album is like so much more of a, like a solid, serious sound um, than I think I had kind of like uh, expected or, or had kind of like associated with uh, the Kings of nothing. Um, and yeah, like, I, I mean, I, I was already, like, I already kind of knew about it. Like, I, I really dug it. Like, they do have a very, like, it's, it's, it's interesting you say they came up in, like, Tiger Army Radio because, like, I feel like that can go one of two directions when, when you're thinking about Tiger Army. Either you, either you fall down that, like, kind of rockabilly, psychobilly, like, path or, like, some of their weird, like, early stuff where they sounded, like, a little hardcore-ish, right? Like, that can kind of, like, spin off in a whole other direction. Um, but like this is like these guys are very I mean they're very squarely in the rockabilly camp you know they they've got like a they've got like a, a much uh, like kind of a more uh, kind of like harder punk rock edge to so they're not really tr like traditional sounding rockabilly um, you know they've kind of they've kind of got that like modern kind of punk rock ish uh, rockabilly sound to them uh, which I super dig um, yeah I don't know man like overall like I, I really I really love this album I really like this band um, that. The, that song, especially like the other side of hope, has like made it into uh, like a, a, just a ton of playlists that I put together on Spotify. It, like it lives in my liked songs list, you know, forever. Uh, so yeah, man, like I, I'm all on board. I, I, I love this band. I love this album. Um, it's it's really it was really solid, like all the way through. Like there's no like there's no skips in that album for me. Um, yeah. You know, it's, I, it's hard to skip it because it's only twenty minutes long. <laughs> <laughs> right? Like, yeah, there's no like, there's no le there's no weak leaks in the chain. You know, I mean, this this whole this whole album to me just like just just hits and hits and hits and, and continues to deliver. Um, so yeah, I've, I'm 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 into it. I liked it. Other side of hope is the one with that uh, like that walking uh, sax uh, part in it, right? Which is like the, the sax is really just dictating the. Uh, the, the the vocal pattern right or, or am i getting yeah. that uh i think that's um, that, that or king for a day um i think i think i think i think king for i think that's probably more room is the king for the thing that sticks out for me at the other side of hope is like how uh like kind of uh deeply remorseful the song is about like you know uh, like i'm not even sure i'm not even sure like the entirety of the actual story you know if there's if it's like based in truth or not i assume it's like at least you know somewhat autobiographical but like that song you know just something so remorseful about like not being able to say goodbye to somebody um before the, i guess before they died you know and then being back together with all of your friends just because of uh like a funeral like that's you know that really like it, i think that's what really like like kind of like punched me in the mouth when i heard it and realized that it was the kings of nothing because like before it all just been like this is just kind of lighthearted, jokey stuff. But like, yeah, that, that's the song. That's the, uh, that's the thing that I think after, obviously after I heard this, I was like, oh, I need to just absorb everything they've done. And every other album, I was like, it's not hitting the same way. Like this really does sound like it was like recorded in like a bathroom with like yeah. just the shittiest of instruments. And which again is what I love about music. Make it dirty. Yeah. Make it fucking dirty. Scotty. What did you think of the Kings of Nothing? I had never heard of this band before. Straight up knew nothing about them, went in completely blind, did no research, took the 20 minutes and just kind of let it happen, as it were. And I'm really glad I did, because this record hit me. Um, there are so few bands that are enjoyable to me in this 
particular subgenre that I come across as a new band. You know, I, I listen to the Cramps, I listen to Tiger Army, stuff like that, but that's the no duh shit. This stood out. The first thing I thought of was the vocals sound like if Mike Ness was trying to do his best leftover crack impression, but better. But better. For being only 20 minutes, it packs so much in this such a short period of time. And for being the type of record it is, like, I, I loved this. I love anything that sounds remotely close to straight up rock and roll unless it gets a little too gimmicky. And this just kind of hit that right pocket between maybe they were a hardcore band two years ago, but they got an upright bassist. I'm cool with that. Let them do what they do. Let them do their thing. Yeah, man, I, I genuinely cannot, like, it, it's so rare for me to find something that just I obsess over so much. And like I said, it was over a week I listened to this album ten times before I came. It was like, oh, man, like, jumped ahead in, like, my long list of albums to pick for this show. It jumped the line. It would get ejected from Disneyland. But fuck it, we're putting it right up front. Uh, yeah, I can't say enough about how much I absolutely love this record. Um, as much energy as it has, they slow it down at the end with King of Nothing, which is just, man, like, you want to talk about just, you know, they bring all this, like, energy with the bass and just a slamming on the piano, and then, boom, they just slow it down and give us a ballad with that just destroyed fucking bomb-exploded voice. And it works. It fucking works. But I digress. I can gush about this album forever let's talk about what ratings we gave this one i'm gonna start with you chris um i gave this one uh it's a it's a solid uh eight out of ten uh flaming dice hanging in the rearview mirror of your uh of your 59 cadillac as it drives away oh it's a great one but and it's fitting for you my friend i don't you know i feel like anyone who knows 59 cadillacs uh johnny what about you uh, nine out of ten times, punk rockers put on the Johnny Idol hats and hit the ragtime club on a Friday night. <laughs> Scotty. Eight out of ten pinup girls in Misfits t-shirts. Ooh. Ooh. Oh, that is hitting way close to home. Uh, <laughs> nine out of ten, I gave this one, nine out of ten songs that sound like Jerry Lee Lewis on meth. So Jerry Lee Lewis? Mm. Well, if Meth is fucking your fourteen-year-old uh, cousin, oh, uh, he, he was high on that shit. Oh, uh, <laughs> rock and roll. Listen, I will give all the credit in the world. The rock and roll of the fifties and sixties to me is just brilliant stuff. But the people who created it are insane sexual <laughs> deviants or oh, awful yeah, human beings. It's terrible, one or terrible. one or two. There's no yeah. middle ground. Uh, Imagine teaching a lesson to uh, to eleven year olds on Little Richard and having to leave out all of that shit. Anyway, uh, before we get out of here, let's uh, plug the social media. We'll start with you, Johnny. Uh, at the concept JT on Twitter and Instagram. Scott A. At SC Cerruti on Twitter and live on IWTV this weekend. H two O, no excuses. Coming off the back of the last extravaganza. Uh, 5.30 start time, and use the promo code HUSTLE for five free days. Hell yes. Chris, what about you, dude? Uh, you can find me on Twitter at uh, that old juke joint, uh, Instagram at Chris underscore horror show. Um, also, this Saturday, uh, coming up, I think, is going to be the, uh, the Camp Leapfrog uh, live experience on in, uh, Independent Wrestling's uh, Facebook page. Uh, so if you uh, have some time, I start at 5.30. This one kicks off at 7, I believe, uh, is, is the start time. So you should be able to squeeze both of them in there. Um, and it's free. Get it on your TV. Get the other one on your phone and just keep switching. Just go back keep and switching forth. like it's Monday night in 1997. Just, uh, just inject yeah. all the wrestling straight in your veins, baby. Uh, yeah. And you can find me on all social media, Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram, at King of Chaos NYC. And you're checking this one out on the Year One Wrestling Podcast YouTube account. Well, you should be following that on all social media as well, at Year, the number one pod. You should be subscribed to the podcast, literally anywhere that you can find a podcast, it will be there. You're going to find it if you search it up. 
uh, within the coming weeks. You're going to get to see the episode that I've got with Chris. And over the next coming long weeks, long ahead, because I still got to get these interviews together, Johnny and Scott will be on the show at some point. So make sure to check that out. If you're digging this content, you're going to love the Year One podcast. Uh, but that's going to do it this week for Dude, Have You Heard This? Uh, on behalf of myself and the guest, Chris, we got to have you back again uh, and another time. This Anytime, man. Last, dude. I want to I want to I want to touch more next time on that. Uh, this concept that I just I was thinking about if if hardcore bands ever made that transition to like a rockabilly sound. I don't know that I can name any. Uh, <laughs> we might as well go through that uh, next time. man. it sounds like a fucking dope concept but for myself and for the guests. We'll see you next time. Yes.